talking to Richard, but uh, um, it doesn't get any easier to use, it actually. Okay, we're live. Uh, this is Lee Blackall back again. We're talking with Joss Wynn and Richard Hall from the UK. These two have offered uh, quite remarkable critical insight, in my view, to the, a range of things, uh, starting with the open education movement generally described, but really reaching deep into um, the crisis um, uh, confronting the university sector and academic work. A crisis is the word they use to describe, so we'll unpack that and why they used that word to describe that. Um, but uh, this is a little impromptu hangout on air to introduce ourselves to each other and try and get to know each other's work a bit better, focusing on Joss and Richard's work. I'm just going to play the lead and ask questions and do the recording and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Joss and Richard, uh, could you kick us off with telling us where you're from and how you guys connect in the past? Starting with, let me see, Joss on the left. <laughs> um, I uh, work in the Centre for Educational Research and Development uh, at the University of Lincoln, uh, which is a, um, a small uh, university in the uh, East Midlands of the UK, and I've worked there since 2007. Um, okay. Yeah. And I started. I started off um, in a kind of educational technologist role, and have um, shifted into an academic role. And did you did you come into that educational tech role? Uh, because you were studying in the university and you found the job, or did you apply off the street? Or you, where did, no, where did I, that um, no, I, uh, my previous work uh, was as um, a film archivist for Amnesty International um, right. and uh, the British Film Institute before that. Um, okay. So my background is in audiovisual archiving, um, but we moved to Lincoln where I grew up. We moved, I moved back to Lincoln. And um, I, I didn't ha have a job at the time, um, uh, but then I saw a job advertised at the university, um, and uh, and it started there. I started working part time, and it it uh, turned into a full time job. So it wasn't and it wasn't a planned it wasn't a planned move. I still feel uh, somewhat of an outsider in academia, um, but I think that's quite a uh, interesting place to be. And uh, just a bit more about the then jump from the educational technologist to the academic role. <laughs> um, well, the centre I work in uh, is intended in, is intentionally a, a mixture of academic and service work. Um, so everyone in my department, um, to a greater or lesser degree, um, is seen as offering uh, support or service um, institution-wide across the university, but at the same time, um, are encouraged um, or, or indeed have kind of primary academic responsibilities. So, yeah, um, yeah the, the, the point is that, that the centre was set up intentionally to bring together and mix up the idea of um, uh, academic research and development that then informed the way that we supported the university. Can you tell me the name of the centre again? The Centre for Educational Research and Development. CERD. Research and Development. Yeah, we call it CURD. Uh, Lincoln.ac.uk slash CURD. Uh, okay. Lucky um, it's not a T. CERD. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so... Uh, I'll yeah, I, I joined CURD originally to um, <laughs> work on a project to set up an open access uh, institutional repository, an ePrint repository. Um, I have long had an interest uh, and kind of uh, existed on the fringes of open source and free software culture. Um, and so the open access movement opened my eyes to other forms of openness. And uh, from there, really, I, I just started kind of um, learning about it, contributing to that agenda within higher education uh, and increasingly being critical of it as well. Um, although, you know, fundamentally, uh, I uh, I think it 
it is a is a positive thing, um, although not uh, not without its its problems and, and cause for critique. Yeah, which we'll get into. Richard, uh, now tell us your backgrounds and um, how you two connect. Well, um, <clears throat> I was a historian when I kind of uh, did my PhD was in um, history back in the day and then um, couldn't get a job lecturing in history so uh, got a job as a researcher on a, um, on a project that was looking at the quality of, of um, care for three and four year olds um, as part of what of part of the new la new Labour government, first new Labour government's Sure Start um, program, where they were putting in kind of wraparound care for um, three and four year olds before school and after school. So we're looking at the quality of provision there in inner city, um, two inner city areas of the West Midlands, Coventry and Birmingham. So we did that for eighteen months, research assistant on that, and then um, then got a job up in uh, Middlesbrough in Teesside. Um, in the north northeast of England, um, which was a project manager on a project that was looking at the, looking at trying to create some um, open access web based resources for um, for the humanities, um, in particular in particular history as it happened, um, some kind of open courseware, and that was funded by the um, the Higher Education Funding Council for England. And then what, um, what year was that, Richard? Well, that was ninety nine to o two. I did that job, and then o two. Really yeah, it was quite early. And then o two, I got a, I got the job down at um, the Montford University in Leicester, which is kind of then was university kind of e learning coordinator, where we were trying to build a, a network um, rather than having a kind of central unit that would that would effectively work as a kind of workshop or factory to. Support staff in creating um, online materials or supporting their curriculum mm -hmm. online. Um, we created a kind of hub and spoke thing. We created a, a network um, to, to try and implement that and try and support staff in owning pedagogic development themselves. And I was the kind of university e learning coordinator. And over time, I've kind of developed that role so that, right, to give it more of a kind of critical pedagogic focus. But um, also to the point where I, I manage a small centre in the university now, the Centre for Enhancing Learning through Technology. Um, most institutions in the UK kind of call it Technology Enhanced Learning. It's a bit people's front of Judea, Judean people's front. But Enhancing Learning through Technology kind of prioritises learning over the tools itself. So that's that's kind of why we did that. So there are there are seven of us in that team. There are four people who work in faculties. I, I'm the kind of strategic lead. Um, we have someone who works with our graduate school as well, um, and somebody who work, who effectively kind of looks at our core tech and reviews our kind of core technologies. So, um, and I've kind of extended that role, I guess, so that it has more of a kind of pedagogic research focus as well, and it enables me to do some of the work that I do with Joss. And um, Joss and I first met at an Association for Learning Technology conference, I think, in something like 2000 and Nine, maybe eight, two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, something like that. It was in Manchester, anyway. Yeah. As I remember, and we were pretty. Uh, as I remember, we were pretty much the um, the only. I can't remember too many critical voices in that space, but I think that we 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 both kind of we were both developing some ideas, and we probably hooked up via sort of Twitter anyway. But we were we we were both developing ideas. That were in the first instance connected to kind of socio, I think socio environmental crisis. So issues to do with um, resource availability, peak oil, mm -hmm. um, climate change, that kind of thing, and what higher education's response to that might be. Um, but that pretty we pretty much kind of then realised that those were symptoms of a deeper kind of malaise, really a deeper kind of mm -hmm. crisis, um, one of, of kind of capitalism, really. Um, yeah, you look, you, to touch on one that just sparks to mind now that when you mentioned that you're the only critical voices, I, I totally relate to that, and that's why you know I guess um, I'm I'm trying to connect with you guys in some way because um, we've got at our university we've got this thing called uh, future ready, a plan for future ready, and uh, in that scenario, a future if they even try to describe it has nothing to do with resource scarcity and peak oils or 
or a any of those sorts of things. It's kind of more like global citizenship and entrepreneurialism, whatever that might be, and, and, and the sustainability without that really explained either. And uh, yeah, so you guys offer some voice to giving some more substance to planning for futures, plural, whatever they may be. Uh, sorry to jump in on that though. So your Fine. connection, you, the connection where I became aware of your work, I think, is when you. I'm not exactly sure, but I'm saying it's probably when you attended Open Education, the Open Education Conference in uh, was it 2010 or 11? I can't remember. Ten. 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 Barcelona. Yeah. And uh, what was the name of the paper that you were presenting there? Do you recall? Was, was it on resilience? Questioning technology, wasn't it? Yeah, on yeah. a resilient university or something like that. Yeah, I think it was. It was. It was the connection between. Um, yeah, it was critiquing or questioning the role of technology in the idea of um, creating a resilient education. Really, in particular, because resilient. The idea of resilience was, um, I guess, was was just kind of developing some momentum. Um, although I, I mean, certainly I, and I guess Joss as well, would want to would actually now want to critique the whole the way in which resilience has been co-opted as a neoliberal entrepreneurial term. Okay, uh, resilience also, there's another guy in the UK I would, you know, from I'm from afar looking at you guys, says um, uh, Dougald Hind, is that is that his name? Do you know his yep. work? He started up the School of Everything yep. and he's another one that started entering my radar where he was talking about resilience and Post scarcity society and, and mm -hmm. focusing on that's on its relevance to education. He's since disappeared off the radar. I might add, though he, he hasn't been hit by a bus or something, has he? Or has he moved on to something else? I think he moved to Sweden. Oh, not that, okay. not that that means he uh, he should disappear. <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> my impression was that you know his personal circumstances changed. He made a few decisions and. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what he's doing now, but uh, mm. yeah, we know Dougal. Um, um, and uh, for a while, he was a visiting fellow at the University of Lincoln. Um, mm. And uh, no, we've had some very uh, interesting um, discussions with him over the years. Yeah, yeah, he seemed um, be one of those charismatic fellows who could probably yeah. make anything work that he was touching on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, but. We, Richard, before we hit broadcast and before Josh joined us, we were discussing this, um, I guess you can only call it a phenomenon, in the absence of a critical voice or the difficulty of introducing a critical voice to fledgling movements like the open education movement and open access, but less so the less so fledging, fledgling into uh, actually the overwhelming force of the technology and education space. Um, what what would you say is making that so difficult? Um, I think it's an international problem, but why, why would you say it's difficult for us to find critical voices, or are we just blind to see it for some other reason? Well, I think that they do exist. Um, certainly, I have, I have no problem, and there's and I have no problem in uncovering, you know, sort of. The work of relatively mainstream um, critical voices, people like I'm currently read or listening to and reading um, David Harvey's kind of um, open um, lectures on Volume Two of Marx's Capital. So there are and and there's plenty of stuff available in terms of um, I don't know things like the Journal for Critical Education Policy Studies as well, just kind of international open access journal which publishes quite a lot. Of ostensibly um, radical um, and Marxist kind of writings about education and education policy, although it accepts other kind of critical perspectives as well. Mm. So there is stuff out there, but certainly I think in terms of the kind of education and technology um, space, it's quite it's quite difficult to get beyond the um, I guess rather trite and banal appreciation of of um, of kind of learner outcomes and, mm. and and learner emancipation, whatever that might be, but without or learner enfranchisement, without ever really critiquing what that means. I don't think it's necessarily just um, part and parcel of the kind of educational technology movement, because you see it more generally in kind of pedagogic research as well. And one of the problems I think is that is that pedagogic research is quite 
nascent and has and is quite recent and has has kind of mm. emerged from in particular a lot of kind of funding council supported projects which means that actually it's tied to very tight kind of outcomes really mm. and, and funding outcomes so it's very difficult to, to, to situate that inside a theoretical perspective those theoretical perspectives do exist you know you have you have people like Stephen Ball at the Institute of Education in London writing about kind of neoliberalism um, and the co-option of education for the market um, and there are a range of other people as well um, there's a whole unit dedicated to that um, around kind of education and globalization down at Bristol for instance so they do exist it's difficult to get them connected I think at times into um, that mainstream of um, the main, mainstream of kind of higher education and technology related work really mm. um, that's quite problematic but nonetheless you guys uh, just turn off my screen share there I'm trying to um, I'm trying to share some of the stuff you, you, you pages and stuff that you mentioned there um, you, just on the side there do you guys know how to share a screen on um, on hangouts it's the button on the left hand side as you scroll over to the left of the main video frame, the second icon down is a little green button with a right-facing arrow. Yeah. So if you wanted to share anything and that you've got <coughs> up on the screen to look at, we'll do it a little bit more later on. Um, the oh, That aside, now I lost what I was going to ask about that, but it, what you're already doing, though, is you're connecting us to what we're here to talk about, is that, that uh, critical theory approach you take to viewing technology, university, or education generally, and um, open education movements and similar things. The, the I must say though, the bit that I struggle with without having that kind of background knowledge is um, Marxism is almost a uh, cringe word from someone who's ignorant to the thing. You know, it's like saying Christ or something like that. Um, and so, and, and, but thanks to you, it's given me the resilience to get past that and look at it, although I, I can only read the reviews and summaries of Marx. I've tried going to the source and, you know, holy shit. So you, you choose to use words like um, academic labor, um, uh, Marxist capitalism and capitalism in the university sector and all that sort of stuff. That now brings me to the, what I was going to ask before. You seem somewhat secure in your places of work or in your careers or in your lives generally to be um, stating these critical angles where I was going to say that in, at least in my experience it's entirely insecure place to be to in your place of work to be offering these critical voices going back to Marxist ideas and stuff and bringing them forward so is there something going on in the UK that is allowing this to thrive or are you guys just bold and confident um, I'll try and answer that first. Um, in my own case, uh, I've been encouraged and supported um, within my university and uh, in my department, um, particularly um, by uh, my colleague Mike Neary. Um, yep. So, it, it for me, um, uh, you know, I came to. Uh, kind of the Marxist critique. Um, well, when Richard and I were uh, writing about and discussing the kind of ecological um, uh, issues, the the energy um, crises, um, uh, you know, you you look for the kind of underlying problems, um, uh, this kind of systemic problems, mm. um, and there are. You know there are there are mainstream ex explanations, um, and there are kind of left-leaning liberal think tanks uh, like the New Economics Foundation in the UK that they they really understand um, the problem on on one level. You know they know they know what peak oil is. They understand the climate problem. Um, they they you know they're very um, uh, articulate. Around these issues and they're anti-growth, um, but they still offer um, what is essentially a, a, a kind of a, uh, a mainstream liberal uh, view of the world, um, and 
as I read um, that kind of critical work, um, I became less and less satisfied with it. Uh, and at the same time, I was having discussions with Richard, um, with Mike Neary, uh, and anyone else uh, that was interested. Um, and I came to find that um, the Marxist, or, or, or rather Marx's, um, critique of capitalism as being the most useful, the most satisfying um, uh, way into trying to understand these larger systemic problems. So mm. when Richard and I were talking, we were writing about you know, resilient university and, and the future of higher education and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, very very quickly we started to try and position this in a in a systemic way, um, and there are very few tools, um, very few theoretical tools um, to to really get a grasp on viewing the world um, in that kind of systemic um, uh, complex way, mm. Um, mm. and um, and so. Um, certain Marxist theorists, not all of them by any means, uh, there's a lot of uh, rubbish uh, has been written over the decades uh, and, and that's quite clear I think, um, you know, in retrospect a lot of Marxists would say there's been a lot of rubbish written, um, uh, but also, you know, developing a critical theory, you, you, you've got to work through it, you've got to, you've got to uh, work through different avenues of, of thought and, and um, I think there's some very perceptive, some very useful critical uh, Marxist social theory available you know today and, and um, so far it provides me with with the, the most satisfying way of trying to understand uh, my my place in the world and, and what I see going on around me. So Are yeah, I, I was supported at work through one or two colleagues um, that were already mm. working in this tradition. Is it the same for you, Richard, or uh, what, what's going on your end? Well, um, you're right. You're right that I'm relatively secure, and I guess that's because um, akin to Joss, really, at Lincoln, I bought you know bought been relatively successful at bringing in project funding. We've also at DMU managed to kind of move the institutional agenda for kind of embedding technologies forward. So you seem to kind of deliver. It's it's kind of um, given me some space to to plan my own uh, to, to to kind of develop a, a a research agenda as well, which is kind of informed by practice. So my early my early kind of writing and work would have been about. Um, Learner empowerment, and it would have been about the the interrelationships between teacher, curriculum, learner, student, and um, technology. But it very it very quickly became clear, I think, um, certainly around for me around kind of in the aftermath of um, the collapse of sort of Lehman Brothers, more stuff that I'd historically always kind of done around environmental issues. Anyway, the fact that I was engaged in a range of Voluntary activities outside the university as a by, as a vice chair of governors on a school on a on an estate with high levels of socioeconomic deprivation. I was a trustee of a homeless shelter in Birmingham as well. Those things kind of add to a general or were adding to a general kind of sense that actually it wasn't enough just to look at whether an individual can be in inverted commas resilient or entrepreneurial or whatever it was. There were that we needed to look at kind of deeper structural, material, systemic kind of um, impacts and what was kind of what, what effectively was driving what, what was driving kind of policy, what was driving strategy, what was driving um, things like the collapse of Lehman Brothers, things like um, things like I guess kind of the stuff that we read about in terms of kind of peak oil or climate change and how do we make sense of that raft of things alongside of an individual's own agency or empowerment. So I started. I was thinking a little bit more about that inside the university. There aren't really that many people. I mean, I've uncovered a few, um, a few colleagues at DMU, guys like George Lambie, who's written extensively on Cuba. He wrote a brilliant book in 2010 on the Cuban Revolution in the 21st century, which offers a, a different alternative um, narrative, a, a more, I guess, a more socialized narrative. 
um, it isn't to fetishize Cuba as as the as a utopia, but to say there is a different way of organizing. Um, mm. So him, also a woman called Sally Ruan at, at DMU, who is involved in kind of lobbying around the privatization of the National Health Service here against that privatization, um, and is also involved in local trades councils. So there were some people who provide points of solidarity. But I would have to say that the, my, my major points of solidar solidarity in this space have, have come really from people I found outside the university. So there have been people at Lincoln in particular, so the Social Science Center at Lincoln gives a lot of kind of energy because it's a space for sort of respectful discussion of alternative ways of organizing and alternative ways of delivering a curriculum and designing a curriculum and that kind of thing and it isn't perfect and it, you know and, and it doesn't have millions of students but there are a committed connect, connected set of people who are willing to cooperate and that's important so there have been people like Mike and Sarah Amsler and, and Joss there who, uh, who are important and also then um, people like you around around the globe who are willing to kind of listen and, and enable you to be heard really so mm. the university's kind of there are things I've done inside the university that have given me space in which I can kind of develop this sort of approach but I, and I think that um, the range of reading that we that both Joss and I have done certainly for me has given me a little bit more kind of security in terms of in in as Joss said thinking that actually um, critical social theory and Marxist, Marxist kind of um, critical theory is a way of anchoring a, an explanation, a way of developing an, explan an interpretation that makes yeah, sense. It does. Uh, that's the thing that I um, guess I'm sensing and holding on to without doing the uh, legwork that you guys are able to do. Yeah. Um, I want to know. What I want to know is, are you? motivated by this because you're trying to boil it down to some operational operating principles or an ethical framework that is modernized or um, up to date somewhat to this seemingly new world that we're um, wrangling with. Are, are you trying to boil it down to that or are you still sort of getting across it all and connecting to the past and stuff before you can be in that position, if you want to be in that position? And I, okay, I'll give you some more time to think about that because uh, from my angle, uh, I'm looking for a solution to um, a university-funded iPad trial, full scale. <coughs> and really, it's a couple of people who are just proving that iPads work in education, and that's about it. You know, and then you try to engage in some sort of questioning about that, and well, forget it. And then, you know, there's even more questionable um, non-disclosure agreements for the sponsorship deal that they got with Apple while you're at it. So over to you guys. Are you, are you trying to come, across, come boil it down to some quickly digestible principles that will help prevent that type of um, intrusion? Um, fortunately, I managed to avoid the uh, kind of work you just described, the iPad trials and that kind of thing. Um, mm. Uh, and, and increasingly over the years, I've, I um, I think I can now justify not getting involved in that kind of work. Um, uh, uh, well, it is you know, Richard, you you answer this. I'll come back to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the this is a, this is a really difficult one. This is a really difficult question because, like, my role effectively is to try to support staff in making critical decisions about the technologies they use and why. However, um, we and and in and in and in so doing, to try and raise ethical considerations. So, um, for for me, it would be talking to to staff. I mean, it's a bit. There's a balance in there between the pragmatics of of what core. I mean, we have a model of core arranged, rec recommended and recognised technology. So the core and arranged stuff is the stuff that the university either hosts or has um, yeah. arranged for it um, through APIs, through inter kind of interoperability, that kind of thing. We also we there is some stuff on the open web that we that we kind of recommend staff use if there aren't any internal 
technologies they want to use, and then there's stuff that's out on the open web that we sort of say, well, we haven't validated terms and conditions. We recommend that you don't use those because we have alternatives that you could use that we do support. Now, one of the issues we have is that we that we have to be pragmatic. For instance, in 2004-5, we um, deployed as an enterprise solution Blackboard, and clearly we might have all sorts of issues with a um, with the deployment of a system that is underpinned by Pentagon contracts that connect you into private equity and hedge funds that connect you into effectively a transnational um, activist network um, that pivots around kind of finance capital. You might have all sorts of issues. One might individually might have all sorts of issues with that, but pragmatically, we've got 1,800 modules being to, being deployed through Blackboard. We have 20,000 students and 2,000 academic staff using them. To migrate those because I, because I might have an issue with that is problematic. So one of the things for me is can we increase the space inside the university where we're, we can have these where we can have critical conversations that might be around the constant um, renewal of technology which has embedded within it, for instance, rare earth metals the labor rights around the mining of which are incredibly problematic. So can we have a conversation about what it means to be permanently renewing technology in the face of unsustainable um, use of resources, but also in the face of the use of child labor in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which goes into and is embedded within all of those tools and technologies. So can we at least widen the space whilst accepting that pragmatically People are still going to want to. Some people are still going to want to use an iPhone. They're still going to want to use an iPad, that, and and just at least have a conversation with them about the fact, about reuse or repurposing, or about the trade-offs, or about what that means in the face of outsourced um, carbon emissions. What that means in the face of labour rights and human rights in Foxconn factories in China, for instance. So, yeah. is there a space to have that? now? At, I have to say, it's quite a brave thing to do. I feel it's quite a brave thing to do to sit in a university committee, to sit in our quality assurance and enhancement committee, where people are just trying to drive specific agendas through and where they're time pressured and where they don't want to be talking about human rights and labour rights abuses. You know, it's quite it's it's it can be quite a courageous thing to at least raise that question. And one of the other things for me is how do we raise those sorts of issues through our trade unions? Because that's because the, the the more I'm in the institution, the more I realise that actually in trying to drive one of the marginalised kind of um, groups in that whole process of negotiating around the curriculum, around the relationship between students and teachers, sure. um, is is the, are the trade unions. And I think and when you say trade unions, do you do you mean the unions that represent the academic staff and the professional staff within yeah. the university, or more broadly, you mean the yeah. wider trades? No, I mean those. I mean those two really, and how those two, how those two um, bodies. So for us, it's Unison who support professional services, and and UCU is the uh, lecturers union. How they work with our students union as well, yep. the, the represent students in trying to move an ethical agenda or a political agenda forward. Okay, so. Um so I can't help you on your that. iPad thing, I'm afraid, Lee. It's, well, you know, no, no, it does because I mean. That's a similar arrangement that I've come to conclude is that those two groups that you mentioned, the student union and the um, the academic union, um, they they you're right, they are absent from the the discussions, or the wider discussions of how the university organises itself going into the future and stuff. They basically react to funding cuts and job losses, and that's it. But they're not engaging in these things. And but without some sort of instrument that gives somebody a quick leg up into this. Um, confounding new world of technology stuff so that they can quickly relate it to the wider social issues that you guys are relating it to but quickly do it. So I don't need um, five years uh, education within the humanities to understand it. I, <laughs> I intuitively understand it. There, there are five principles here and you know my collective wisdom is informing me on this. So that's why I guess I was asking if you guys are trying to boil it down to that uh, well, maybe you think you're already there, and I'm just telling you you're not. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to speak for Josh. My take on it is that it that it's very difficult to boil it down to to principles. I think it's about reading and rereading and interpreting, mm -hmm. reinterpreting, and, just, and trying to get a sense of um, 
how how for, for me my kind of day to day role how technology informs institutional cultures institutional organizing principles how it informs um, the use of resources how it informs social our social relationships um, our relationships be between staff students mm. staff and staff staff and managers all those sorts of things so it's trying to think about those and trying to write about those and it's a developing ongoing process so it, it I, I find it difficult to kind of boil stuff down but I do want to and allied allied to that just trying to um, get people to think about the the emotional investment they have and the values that they have that kind of try to move this forward as well but one of the things that I'm quite that increasingly I guess I'm kind of more taken with is um, the work of Andrew McGettigan um, who wrote how do you spell McGettigan uh, M C G E Double T I G A N, and he wrote this book called *The Great University Gamble*. Um, it's receiving quite a lot of airtime at the moment. But one of the things that he does brilliantly well, I think, is to take the detail, is to explode the detail of of, of policy changes, of reforms to higher education, for instance, and in particular around finance. So it's to show, is to uh, is the devils in the detail. So he follow the money, follow the follow the kind of detail of what of what and of what. I guess for me, uh, what a technology represents. So one of the things I'm quite interested in is is looking at particular providers, so Pearson, or um, for instance, as an educational content provider, or looking at looking at um, FutureLearn, for instance, the UK HE's um, Russell sector, the kind of top universities in inverted commas, their their MOOC platform, for instance, looking at that and trying to um, Trying to explode that and see who's involved in that, which networks are involved in that, which partnerships are involved in that, which organisations, which people are involved in that. Um, what are the ideologies that underpin them? What are the decisions that are being made that drive them? And then trying to relate that back through to some form of cre critical theoretical perspective, really. So I think being able to give people real world examples and, like, for instance, the iPad, for instance, and see what is embedded within that and then enable people to come to their own decisions or ask their own questions is critical. Yeah, and, uh, and fundamental to all of that is some sense of security for people to develop that, that voice. So I suppose a university who's setting up uh, an educational technology unit or a curriculum development unit needs to give space for critical theory to develop around that space. So it's not just professional development, it's not just the next tool and how we're going to roll that out or what staff are going to support the blackboard upgrade and stuff like that, but it's it's people like yourself engaged in that sort of thing. Josh, yeah. have you got something to add there? Well, just, um, you know, going back to this idea of this uh, security of being able to think these things and, and, and talk about these things, um, you know, it, of course it's not wholly secure, there's a risk to it, um, but as Richard said, you know, uh, and, and we probably don't uh, highlight really is that both of us kind of um, kind of have been relatively relatively successful in um, bringing in grants and things like that, right? So mm -hmm. we provide value to our employers to the university, um, and those grants, those projects, create space for us to obviously undertake the research that um, you know we're paid to do but then also to form our own opinions about it you know this is this is part of what you know so-called academic freedom is about right uh, there is still a certain amount of autonomy within the academy and uh, particularly uh, autonomy attached to um, externally funded projects and grants so well, I, I think it, it must be very hard to to just to be able to justify to our employers um, to spend the the necessary time to develop this critical thinking to develop these critiques to to uh, kind of campaign um, in this critical way um, if it if it doesn't offer any return uh, or, or visible return um, and so the, the way that you know, I've been able to do this is because, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis for the last four years, I've run 
various uh, funded projects. Uh, and I've carved out the, the space uh, and the time through these projects, which have all, in one way or another, related to openness in higher education. Um, this, this idea of openness, open, educa open education, open educational resources, open data, open source, whatever. Um, and it's through doing that um, that I've been able to, to, to open up a space. Uh, and also, um, in, in the kind of more critical writing that I do, I relate that back to the kind of nuts and bolts of these projects, these kind of tangible things um, that we do on a daily basis. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that that's that's how it's happened for me. And, and Richard mentioned okay. earlier that that was one of the the, the things that has uh, has helped him. The fact that um, you know, uh, on the face of it, uh, we bring in bring in money. <laughs> you bring it to that. Uh, you bring it to that. Uh, and yeah, so, no, the academics all across the world. Helped. It certainly helped. Um, I think it certainly helped me in terms of giving mm. me space. I mean, the academics across the world, uh, especially the established ones, who are nodding. Yep, it's the bring in the funding and then, um, what is it, publish or perish uh, <laughs> as well on the back of that. But then that funding, let's talk about that. So, as far as I can tell, the major funders internationally for those fields, open education resources, uh, Hewlett, uh, um, what is it, William and Hewlett, Hewlett and Flora, um, sorry, William and Flora, Hew uh, Hewlett Foundation is all I know it as, uh, the Belinda, Belinda and um, Bill Gates Foundation, I keep forgetting the spouses' names, and that's telling, isn't it? And then there's the the guys, uh, the office, the spring out of Canical who do Ubuntu down in South Africa, uh, Shuttleworth Foundation. To me, they're the three big funders of open education. Where where are your funds coming from, and are they applied in like tangible projects like an iPad or a rollout <laughs> or, or something similar? And then you're writing into the description of those projects some sort of um, uh, theoretical analysis or um, or critique of the the project. Do you want to talk? Uh, well. Uh, uh, one of the major funders um, for me, and uh, um, I think Richard has been funded as well by JISC uh, in the UK. Of so course, JISC, of course. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, uh, technology related uh, research and development in UK higher and further education. Um, and they've been big uh, supporters and promoters of, of openness, open education, uh, particularly open educational resources. Mm. So, uh, yeah, all of my projects over the last few years um, have been funded by them um, and no I don't write in I don't write in um, uh, the kind of kind of critical theoretical work that comes out of those projects that's what I do uh, as a kind of a that's quite personal to me it's not it's not intrinsic to the project right um, uh, but yeah that, that's how it's that's how I've worked um, uh, and yep. been funded by okay. JISC. And of course, JISC, JISC funding uh, has changed a lot in the last couple of years, oh. so that, that all may well change. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, yeah, it's it's a, may well uh, leave me. I know the feeling. In Australia, we had the Australian Flexible Learning Framework, um, about the same era of funding as JISC, although JISC survived a little longer. I think AFL, uh, Australian Flexible Learning Framework still exists, but um, yeah, that was the, the big investment in here. It, Richard, are you also um, milking the JISC fund? <laughs> um, we, um, the, fu the funding that we have had um, for our kind of technology related education and technology projects has come from either from the um, Higher Education Academy, um, which is kind of a national body that supports um, educators uh, across across um, the UK, or it's come um, from an individual award I got from the Higher Education Academy as a national teaching fellow. So I've been able to use some of that to support. Um, some work that we've done always come from JISC, as Joss says. But just recently, the most recent two have been um, the university gets some innovation fund money. So it's a higher education innovation fund 
in partnership with um, one of them in partnership with Leicester City Council, and that's our, um, which is a local city, municipal city council. Um, so that project, which is a digital, it's called DigiLit Leicester. Um, so it's it's just uh, D I G I L I T L E I C dot com, I think. Uh, and DigiLitLeicester.com. Yeah, um, if you just kind of Google digi digital literacy Leicester, um, that project um, is about. It's a kind of it's a it's a project that is focused upon the professional identity of of secondary school educators, teachers in in our city, and um, so we created a, a effectively a um, an evaluate self evaluation framework with some CPD connected to it. Now, I will in. We're going to write about that in terms of the process and what has been achieved, and we'll get. We'll, we've got a paper that we're resubmitting to Research and Learning Technology about that and about what it means to digitally to work with staff on their own digital identity, really. And part of that, for me, will be a reinterpretation of those outcomes or an interpretation of those outcomes based on um, the on professionalisation or reprofessionalising. Um, a group of people who are under attack from um, policymakers and politicians mm. in this country. So it will be to effectively, uh, I will be trying to enable, I guess, an argument, uh, a space to open up in which we can argue for the professional identity of our educators um, and to mm. give them a voice, really. So yeah. that that isn't a, that isn't written into the the bid. The, the bid documentation that we submitted um, and that we will focus on is around creating the framework, around implementing the framework, around evaluating the framework and seeing whether it's transferable into the university and to other local authorities. But part of that, it's, in, it's impossible for me to kind of do that without thinking through, well, what, is it, what does it mean to be um, a teacher? What, is it, what, is, what, is, what, is te what does the teacher's labour look like in that space? And can we do some, is there some follow-on work we can do around that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Digital literacies and it's forming using that as a defense against the, what were the words you used? The assault on um, their professional work or, or something like that. Uh, I mean, academic work, a lot of academics, particularly in the humanities in the UK, um, are in the crosshairs of those who would redistribute the funds and adjust the education sector. And so would you extend the argument to them as well that developing, if you want to call it digital literacies or an awareness of how communications works through the, through the web and stuff and developing a, an online profile in defense of that? Is that a similar kind of um, approach, do you think? Who's going to take that? You, Richard. I haven't got much to say about digital literacy. No. Um... <clears throat> For me, it's about using it. I think in the same way that when Joss was talking about kind of open, the idea of open, for me, the the digital literacy kind of agenda that we're trying to, sp I'm trying to open up a space in which we might use digital literacy as a way of either critiquing other uh, models that have been put forward. You know, kind of digital native, digital immigrant, yeah, yeah. visitor, resident. Which not quite a lot of time for the work that kind of Dave White at Oxford has done. But in in and of, in and of themselves, I think don't enable us to engage with what it means to produce or consume or contribute or distribute within a capitalist economy, effectively within a within a within a, a set of capitalist social relations. So for me, it is well, are there things that we might Analyze in terms of what, in terms of digital literacy that that connect to I don't know the um, the autonomous Marxist kind of approach to um, cognitive capital or intellectual labour or the um, or effective labour, for instance, or issues to do with that they would raise around things like the social factory. So are there? Are there things that we can, can we explode the idea of, can we use digital literacy as a crack through which we might analyze other yeah. processes in defining the curriculum? Or in terms of kind of what our work means, can we use it as a crack to analyze other things and to shed light on other processes? And if we can, what might we do as a result? But I think, and for me, I, I'm, I'm kind of attracted to the idea of digital literacy in terms of what it means for work, really. Yeah. 
I mean, the, I, I'm trying to pick up the link to it while you were talking to a recent um, post about the, the, the phrase, the term of phrase, digital literacy, used as a kind of um, lever in on people who may be conscientious uh, Luddites to the conscientious Luddites to the whole technology field, or just some sort of guilt trip, I guess, about not understanding how you know Web two works and all that sort of stuff, and then the usual line to these these people are coming in as um, you know, the world has fundamentally changed by Web 2 with the Arab Spring and all that sort of stuff. It's time to get digitally literate. And that's their justification for now paying the consultants to come in and teach people how to use uh, Gmail. So, um, but that, but yeah. the, the, that's all just going to keep, that's all always going to happen. That's, that's just going to keep happening. Um, mm. uh, and while it may be frustrating um, to be part of that, while. <coughs> Agree with it. Um, it. It's it's also these are also opportunities to kind of um, kick off of, yeah. um, and so you know if it's iPads, if it's kind of this this uh, idea of digital literacy, which of course is is fundamentally a you know a, a good idea that 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 um, you know the the kind of increasingly digital world is made more accessible for people to understand and and. Uh, and comprehend, and and, mm. uh, and from there, you'd hope that s some of them did so critically. Um, mm. But you know, you can, I, and and I think this is, um, you know, coming back to why Marx and Marxist social theory is is so useful, is that you can take anything, you know, take take iPads and and some ridiculous file that you might have to do in the university with them, um, and and you can. You know, albeit probably quite slowly, if you've not uh, read in this area, if you've not kind of learned um, uh, this approach uh, before, but you can you can take something like that and start to unravel it. Um, and actually, you'd start with a, a, a trial of iPads in some university somewhere in the world, and you'll be able to unravel that until you have a have a, a systemic um, kind of uh, view a kind of a, a view of a, a social totality where that iPad and that particular trial uh, uh, in that particular university is situated, uh, and and there'll be, um, you know, th there'll be a, <coughs> a a theory behind why that is taking place and the implications mm. of it, um, uh, and it, it's not something that I, I think you can expect. I certainly. Would not expect to learn how to do in, in a in a week or two, or even in a semester's course. You know, this is something that actually is hard work. You know, it's really fucking hard work. Um, uh, and I first started reading um, Marx in t what 2009, and I, I feel like I'm only just starting to be able to articulate it. Mm. You know, to you, um, and, and I still struggle. Um, I think so, that's really. You know, I, I think sorry. One, sorry. No, you carry on with that point. Well, it, it, you know that one of the one of the things that we we uh, we're increasingly coming to expect is that you know over the web that we should be able to kind of solve problems quickly. We should be able to come up with answers and come to conclusions quickly. The conversation's got to keep moving all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, you know, it, if you can if you can come up with a good explanation. Uh, uh, um, to why that iPad trial is taking place in your university it, it, this year, um, and you can do that in in a year's time, I'd be impressed. You know, mm. th these things take a long time to think mm. through and to, to explain, uh, and, and, and not to trivialise. Um, mm. I think um, the um, yeah, go on, Richard. Yeah. No, I was only going to say I agree totally with Joss. Really, I mean, I, I when I. When I had be my starting point was was not um, was not really the right on this was not really the writings of Marx. It was interpretations of Marx that I could kind of get to I could get to grips with the kind of the scope of of what we were trying to deal with. So there were so in particular um, David Harvey's kind of companion to Capital Volume One and his work on um, the crises of, of, of capitalism 
very important for me, but also some of the writings of people like um, John Holloway, also Mike Neary, um, in, um, and Anna Dinnerstein, in, in thinking about different kind of facets of the kind of the critical theoretical approach. So maybe looking at looking at something like money, for instance, and being able to kind of think about that, or something, some of those other terms like value, which give you a way a, a, an in really to try and explode a particular theme or term. So I spent quite a lot of time reading around those um, writers, what people had kind of were beginning to, or were spending a whole career trying to trying to understand really. Um, before I then came on to sort of to, to reading Capital volumes one, two, and three. So I'm trying to look at the kind of the the material Marxist kind of materialist materialist kind of approach in those spaces, and also his theories of surplus value, but also then recognizing that Marx has a very deep historical approach as well, thinking about um, the, the, the failed European revolutions of 1848, also thinking about the Paris Commune, his writings on the Paris Commune, also thinking about his approach to kind of the, 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 Euro, the, the global sort of depression of 1858-9 as well. So trying to think about these things historically and materially and trying to explode them, but not starting with the kind of the primary sources as were, well, but starting with other people's interpretations and then coming on to primary sources and then revisiting the primary sources but also uncovering one or two books that have made a real difference, I think, and trying to spend a lot of time thinking about those. And and two that are particularly important for me are Amy Wendling's 2009 book on Marx and alienation, which talks about technology, and is probably the one of the best written tra an analyses um, that I've, I've come across. And the other that I really like is... Um, Marshy Postone's Time, Labour and Social Domination, which which kind of explains the kind of deeper interconnections, relationships to kind of time and helps us think about sort of labour a little bit more. So those are things that have kind of grabbed my attention a little more. Um, mm -hmm. But it, but Joss is right, it's hard work, you know. Yeah, and yeah. what I'm thinking about, what I've been thinking about at the start was not really um, where, where I am now, but that isn't necessarily a a problem because these things kind of build and shift and change over time and, and just give you a, a, a confidence in as just as exploding or unraveling mm. certain perspectives and trying to give them a deeper critical analysis. So for me it is so now so I've moved on now to thinking about a little bit more about labor, about time and about cooperation. But that isn't where I was a year ago. Yes. I mean, uh, thanks, Joss, for putting in those links. So when I post this uh, video, I'll update with those links to what Richard was talking about. Um, I mean, uh, I can s second that, that, you know, th through you guys and a few other people I associate with the university, I get their interpretations of not only Mark's uh, writing. And then you might laugh, but I loaded up Mark's capital, uh, I can't remember what volume, as an audio book on, uh, for my bike rides in, and uh, that, was no way to, that was no way to access Mark's, you know. <laughs> so I gave that one up pretty quick, so I'll come around again. I mean, we've been going a fair old while, and we didn't look at your slides there, Richard. Let's just have a quick peek, just a quick peek, so we don't use up too much more time, if you don't mind, because um, I want to refer to that, and maybe we'll come back again to look at it, excuse me while I just find it. It's, uh, I mean, the title of this Hangouts on Air is the same title as these slides, University Technology and Cooperation. There are 46 slides. I'll just have a quick skim. What's the beginning, Richard? Tell, just quick, quickly review us on that. Well, the, um, the, whole thing, the whole thing really just boils down to um, we are, we're, I guess my starting point is that, that, that we are witnessing a secular crisis of capitalism, which is the inability of the system on a global scale to get a stable, stable forms of accumulation um, uh, so effectively in spite of quantitative easing, in spite of um, pro the privatization of public resources. <coughs> You can't the, the system is still struggling to, to, to reenact growth. You can't get growth back on the on um, on an, any kind of stable form. So, mm -hmm. and that is that affects um, the structure of the university. It affects the curriculum of the university. It affects 
the way in which the university is constituted. So for me, really, I'm trying to understand whether there is a different way. And one of the way, one of the one of the things there is trying to understand whether more cooperative, as opposed to privatised forms of education, might offer alternatives. In particular, in the face of um, this crisis of capitalism, but also, you know, in in light of the fact that the IP CC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Royal Society here in the UK are all, chain, are, are all stating that we face catastrophic environmental change unless we um, seriously reconsider, unless we, unless we revolutionize, revolutionize our, um, uh, the way in which our society is constituted, and the way in which it is produced and the way in which we live our lives. So for me, I'm, I'm interested in whether there are alternatives. And so through that kind of whole presentation, I guess I critique where we currently are in order primarily to try to look at where alternatives exist. And yes. for me, a lot of those alternatives are either in, are in the cooperatives movement as it exists in the UK and the Social Science Centre in Lincoln is part of that movement. Um, and, but it's also... It also exists in the cooperatives, in, in the kind of, kind of cooperative culture that exists in South America, I think. Yeah, okay. And to me, uh, through watching your work, particularly as you were um, co commenting on the situation in the UK, as it seemed, uh, a year or two ago, and you started seeing, um, you know, uh, departments in the universities being shut down and then re-emerging in squats and stuff and running these kind of voluntary lecture series and then you saw it in the Occupy movement and, and you see it in various various other places. To me it, cl it clarified what you're trying to explain here in separating the romantic notion of the university as a public good etc from the corporate aspect of it. Uh, to me it, it too often blurs over and, and you have people who uh, instrumental in the corporatization, but thinking they're doing the public good aspect of it, and and not really seeing the contradiction in terms um, that uh, become apparent at some stage. So to me, uh, the distinction between the two is becoming clearer as time goes on. Well, I think one of the one of the issues for me is, I guess. Um, whether it is possible to redeem the university in its current form, mm. <clears throat> and I don't think it is. Mm. I think that, I think that I think that the game is up. I think that that services are being outsourced. That that um, debt-driven higher education is the only game in town. There's no there's no will from kind of leadership either inside the university or from mission groups to talk about anything other than money, effectively. Yeah. So the university is a private positional good in its current form is the only game in town. I think, therefore, that what is important is to, are to keep alive stories of historical or cultural difference where we might organize and develop and deliver ways of living, of knowing, of organizing our, ourselves and our curriculum, whether we can keep those alive. So we can keep them alive in part inside the university and we can fight for we can fight against outsourcing and against privatization and we can support student occupations and we can support our trade unions but actually I think we have to look to organizations like the Social Science Center for instance in Lincoln um, and other autonomous spaces in order to keep all the history of alternatives, the reality of alternatives alive. Mm. Yep. yep, that's clear. The you know I don't, I don't d disagree with any of that. The, there's the, the university is the way it is, um, not not because there's you know uh, a bunch of neoliberal governors in place, or not because you know there's certain personalities in in in, in, in charge of the university who, who are taking it one way. The, the universities are becoming what they are becoming all the time um, because of a particular logic. Um, it, you know, if you want to call it a logic, um, but it, uh, and, and Richard picked up on it earlier, and and it's commonly called growth, and that is if you don't have growth in an economy, then you have impoverishment, um, uh, and you have crises. Um, now, 
so if you want a way in to, to, to trying to understand the problem and, and you want a way in that, that we all, well, actually I don't think we do understand, but it's talked about constantly, and that is economic growth. Yeah? Um, and in Marxist terms it might be called you know, capital accumulation or whatever, um, uh, or, or valorization, this, this need to constantly create more value all the time. Um, and, so, and this is how I think, uh, certainly I did, and I think uh, at the time when Richard and I were, were kind of uh, reading and writing around this idea, uh, idea of a, a resilient university, we, we came a, a, to this, this, this problem of growth. Um, and, and you'll get, um, as I said earlier, people like the New Economics uh, Foundation who do good work, uh, and they're anti-growth. But they don't actually, they don't actually have a not to, in my mind a, cons, a convincing theory for, for for why growth is is so intrinsic to to contemporary life and you know the contemporary kind of ways of survival really. Um, uh, nor do they have a a, a satisfactory um, alternative. Um, and so, so you know if. It, the university is the way it is because it's got to keep growing. If it doesn't keep growing, then people are put out of work and they become poor. Um, uh, you know, I live in a, a small city. I grew up here. I, I went away and I came back when I was older. Um, and the university has changed it fundamentally. This city for the positive. You know, um, it, it, it's it's a it's a good place um, to to go to work uh, in general, and it's it's an important. Thing in, in in this city, um, and I think people's lives are enriched by it. Um, the problem is um, that uh, I'm not convinced it can continue, and the shape that it necessarily has to take, um, I think, is uh, is increasingly going to uh, uh, put people in debt. Um, it um, uh, you know, graduates are going to be increasingly unemployed uh, and therefore unsatisfied with, you know, with with the whole purpose and point of a university. Mm. And um, the debt they pay. Mm. Yeah. So, so th yes, you know, the, the, the university is taking a particular form. Um, you know, universities in general, um, and it's not, in my mind, it's not really about finger pointing. It's not about about kind of critiquing particular universities for what they do. Uh, they do what they do because they have to. I don't think, you know, uh, 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 and <laughs> you know, there is no alternative. There, there is an alternative, but actually in practice, um, for people working in a university, there really is no alternative um, because mm. they'll be put out of a job. Um, so, you know, w we have to maintain a critique alongside um, some form of acceptance of what is going on. If we don't have some form of acceptance, then we go mad. Um, you know, we, we 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 cannot live with ourselves, right? So we have to we have to accept what we see around us, but maintain a form of critique and develop a form <laughs> of critique. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's I think that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to understand mm -hmm. this logic. That, that I see kind of unfolding around me uh, uh, that's taking place um, at, you know in, in the hope that you know for instance you know when my daughter goes to university or, or, or you know or, or leaves home that that, that it, it hasn't necessarily gone in the singular direction that it seems to be going in um, mm. you know if, if I was to put a bet on it I would bet that things will carry on pretty much the way they do that that uh, that there'll just be crises after crises and you know I don't see an end to it but I do see uh, increasingly a need um, to critique it and to understand it there is satisfaction just in understanding things in your mind even if nothing else changes in the world there's a certain amount of satisfaction in knowing in looking around you and seeing and understanding, or at least thinking you understand why the world is fucked up, it's far more satisfying than looking around you and seeing the world's fucked up and not having a clue why. Um, <laughs> you know. So I, fair you enough. Know, I, 
that that this is this is how I kind of approach things. Although uh, I do wonder that those people who are looking around and seeing the world is fucked up by in surprise, so it's only hit them at the last minute. Uh, they they yeah. must be uh, a blissful state right until the end. <laughs> Yeah, but it, you know, it, it comes to everyone at some, you know, mm -hmm. people find people come to realizations about their lives and about the world at different times and in different places. You can't expect mm -hmm. everyone to come on board with you, can you? Um, mm -hmm. that, you know. Let me let me um, end the broadcast there, Josh, because that's something really to to stew on. Uh, what you just <laughs> Richard, did you want to say anything? Well, the only no, I think you're. It's a balance, isn't it? In the same way that it's a balance in the institution uh, um, between prag the pragmatics and really your kind of own internal kind of philosophy, that that you that you're not going to you know we are not going to revolutionise um, the means of production like that. We're not going to revolutionise the kind of the way the way in which we construct our society and the way in which kind of abundance and scarcity are managed. But we can have a reasoned I think um, evidenced and theoretically under underpinned discussion about what is happening and about what alternatives exist and what alternatives have existed historically and currently exist culturally and what and what might be done. And I think it's constantly raising, try, working to raise awareness ab about the cro about the the, cro the current condition and about the crisis. And I think that that is part of our work. I was I've all, I always return back to. A blog posting that I will I'll I'll email to you um, that was um, by a guy called who goes by the by the pseudonym on Twitter of Pierce Penniless and it was around the time that the London Stock Exchange went into occupation and he and he was talking about um, about established activists refusing to go and engage because you know these were newbies and what do they know and they were just kind of having fun and they weren't up for the serious work of, of kind of protest and dissent and disobedience and pushing back and he said that actually no that's the, 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 the only possible strategy for change is having the same goddamn conversation a million times with a million different people in order to try to reveal what was going on in the world and understand the world and come to some kind of inner understanding and I think Joss is right that there is some peace in having in finding an inner understanding of the world and then in, in attempting to talk about that with other people and I think it's that balance of pragmatism and conversation and listening and, and change that is kind of critical I think if you're going to kind of come, come to some sort of internal resolution. Mm -hmm.